adherents waiting for his return. The SDA may be described as the people who are committed to the resumption of reformation work that was begun by Martin Luther, which had led to the rejection of teachings and practices such as the sales of indulgence that were not based on biblical teaching. Luther had emphasized justification by faith as taught by the Bible. The initial success being over, Martin Luther got distracted, took a wife in marriage, and continued to be intimidated by the threats from the papacy. In the meantime, the Catholic Church had also introduced the Counter-Reformation and purged itself of the more common abuses, including the veneration of saints. It took another four centuries before the unresolved issues of the doctrine of the church that were to be addressed again more intensively. The search in the scriptures led the SDA to identify among other elements the seventh day Sabbath observance as missing from the practice of the Christianity that was introduced by the Lord Jesus during his ministry on earth. Like all Christians, especially of the Protestant dispensation, the SDA members accept the Bible as the only authority, the Word of God, believing in the Godhead, the Trinity, creation, the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the ascension, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the power of faith and life of holiness. The church also paid attention to the teaching of Christian values, the gospel, baptism by immersion, like Jesus did, the celebration of the Holy Communion, the forgiveness of sin, salvation and sanctification, the celebration of the Lord, Lordship of Jesus as Savior and Redeemer, through whose sacrifice on the cross at Calvary, and the empowerment of man to live a life of holiness that will always please God. These elements have remained common features in Pentecostal churches and constitute the pillars and doctrines of Christian churches as Isaiah Bolaniwa recently demonstrated in his study. The uniqueness of the Seventh-day Adventist church is most visibly manifested in its insistence that as Jesus worshipped on the seventh day of the week, his followers must observe, must also observe the day set aside at creation for worship, the seventh-day Sabbath. There are other unique features, such as feet washing at the Holy Communion service, just as Jesus did to his disciples at his last supper, avoidance of jewelries, including wearing of earrings and abstinence from alcohol alcoholic beverages and other stimuli. The arrival of the Seventh-day Adventist mission in Nigeria. Following the decision of the SDA to follow the Great Commission to take the gospel to all parts of the world, the church sent missionaries to Africa early in the 20th century. The pioneer SDA missionary to Nigeria was Elder David Caldwell Babcock, who was requested by the General Conference of the SDA to proceed to Nigeria in 1914 eight years after he started work in Syria alone. Accompanied by two Africans, Elder Caldwell Babcock arrived in Nigeria by boat from Syria alone through Ghana, then the Gold Coast, on the Sabbath day of 7th March, 1914. This was just two months after the amalgamation of Nigeria in January 1914, and one year after the death of Ellen G. White, who had played a dominant role in the founding of Seventh-day Adventist movement in the United States. When the SDA church arrived in Nigeria, it came with the message of the good news of the arrival of the Son of God to earth, his crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and the promise of his return, doctrines which the Christians already knew. The public were, however, puzzled by the practice of the Sabbath and the application of the doctrines such as feet washing at the celebration of the Holy Communion. The lack of understanding of the basic beliefs of the church made ignorant observers describe the church as a cult, linking it together with the Jehovah Witnesses. It was later, when there was a better appreciation of what the church taught and did, that the stigma of the cult disappeared from references to the SDA church. Bangkok was encouraged to leave the major cities and proceed to the villages. This was why the established SDA, SDA established the tradition of locating in the rural areas and found itself 
First in the rural towns and villages such as Eromo, Sao, Kotekiti, Ihe, and Jengri, rather than the major cities such as Lagos, Ibadan, Jos, and Aba. On the departure of Babcock from Nigeria, E. Ashley arrived from England to resume the work begun by Babcock. Ashley was succeeded by W. McClement until he was transferred to Accra, Ghana in 1946 as the president of the new West African Union mission. Jesse Clifford later arrived from Sierra Leone and Ghana to begin work in eastern Nigeria, while W.G. Till opened the station at Otoekiti. J.J. Hyde and his wife arrived in northern Nigeria in 1931 and opened the Jangri station. Their son, a medical doctor, J.A. E. Hyde, took charge of the SDA hospital at Jengri. Many of the pioneer Seventh-day Adventists were initially members of the Church Missionary Society, CMS, who took the decision to move to the SDA denomination for a variety of reasons, but also out of conviction about the validity of the Seventh-day Sabbath message. This is illustrated by the story of Isaiah Ajibola Balogun, one of the first pioneer ministers of the church. Balogun was a member of the CMS who had traveled to meet Babcock at Elomu and immediately accepted the SDA message. He was ordained a minister one year after meeting Babcock and made an evangelist and pastor. Until his death, age 65 in 1947, Balogun was a tireless, trailblazing SDA missionary in various parts of Western Nigeria beginning at Ipoti Ekiti. Other missionaries drawn from Western Nigeria included Dese Dari, Jeremy Adeoye, Jiwo Lomo Jobi, Jacob Uwolabi, Iwo Shundele, and J.A. Adeniji. Pastor J. Adeyema Adeogun was elected the first national president of SDA in 1961 and was succeeded by D.K. Omale, Omaleye and subsequently by J. Adeniji and D.O. Babalola. School planting and investments in education. By 1914, the Seventh day Adventist Church had been preceded by the Catholic Church, which had planted a church and established a school in Bini as early as 1515. The early missionary efforts were aborted by the trade in human cargo and were only revived during the abolition movements of the early 19th century. The Methodist Church, then represented by the Wesleyan Missionary Society, pioneered the modern work of evangelism in 1842 when it accepted the invitation from the Yoruba emigrants from Syria alone. The Church Missionary Society, CMS, followed 10 days later. Other missions, including the Baptist Mission, Catholic Mission, and Presbyterian Mission also arrived. These missions, frequently supported by the wave of missionaries, including the Holy Ghost Fathers, who arrived in 1881, worked diligently introducing schools and planting churches, mostly in the major cities in southern and middle belt of Nigeria, as they were discouraged from operating in the Muslim caliphate in the far north so as not to provoke the Muslim rulers. For there had been some understanding which was reached that their influence would not be affected by the colonial conquest and rule in the country. Although the SDA excelled in the promotion of non-formal education, and in its distance learning efforts through correspondence courses of the Voice of Prophecy teachings, the church, however, scored low on its contribution to the formal education sector. Thus, while the Catholic Church, the Baptist, the Methodist, and CMS had secondary schools in most major cities, by 1960, the SDA secondary schools were only two, less than what the CMS had in just Ibadan City, where it established Ibadan Grammar School in 1913, Lagelu Grammar School in 1956, and Yejide Grammar School for Girls in the same year. Its education work in teacher preparation similarly made very little slow progress. Primary schools were few, and most of the schools prepared the pupils only to standard four, and sending only a few carefully selected pupils to proceed to the few central schools to complete the primary education program of the standards five and six. There was only one teacher training college, which was established in Ibadan in 1932. The college was transferred to Ihe in eastern Nigeria in 1947. An Adventist training college was later founded at Otoekiti in 1955. In the meantime, there was not a single secondary school until 1947 when a secondary school was established at Ihe. Yet, education was indisputably expected to be at the core of development of the individual 
the community, the nation, and the International Committee of Nations. Thus, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, made the point pungently at the preamble to its constitution of 1945. The idea is that education should be introduced, if possibly, at conception, and that the young must be caught and groomed from early days, if possible, hours of birth. Planting of schools and educational institutions should thus be made an important part of the operation of the Great Commission of publishing the glad tidings, making known to the world the unsearchable riches of Christ and winning souls to Christ. Perhaps this was understandable given the size of its work, workforce and limited funding cap capability. The departure of Babcock also played a role, for he was so enthusiastic and trailblazing in his pioneering work. He had decided to return to Europe after three years of sowing the seed with the aim of mobilizing human and material resources for the next phase of the work. Tragically, his boat was attacked by the German craft, and after he survived the accident, he decided not to return to Nigeria and continue his work. He therefore never visited the country again, only his death about two decades later. The political development in Nigeria, which brought about self-government for the regions as from 1954, had considerable effect on the education work of the SDA. As news arrived about the prospective independence of the country, it became imperative that additional facilities for post-primary education was required to meet the need of the church. The, the, the realization of this need led to the founding of post-primary education institutions, the entry of Aqua and Aswa. Post-secondary education was also recognized as important for the work of sustaining the work of the missions. Therefore, all the missions con consider training and human resource development of critical importance. For the Seventh-day Adventists, it became clear that missionaries needed to be adequately trained. The church also appeared guided by the principle introduced by the Lord through Gideon that only the able, competent, and willing to endure needed to be prepared for the work of the church. The church was aware of the need to produce the educated elite that would pr preach the gospel, but who would also need to be like Paul, who made tents for a living while preaching the gospel. The institution would thus be, be made to introduce some courses in business, administration, agriculture, and other basic livelihood requirements. As independence of Nigeria came close and more opportunities were available for an imagined educated elite, the SDA church had no choice other than joining in establishing higher education institutions. Besides, it was discovered that sending Nigerian workers to Bekwai Training School in Ghana posed considerable inconvenience. This was the background to the establishment of the Adventist College of West Africa, Aqua, at Elisha in Rema, land of Western Nigeria, to serve the whole of West Africa and remaining an Adventist institution and a college, a higher institution. There has been some discourse on the choice of Elisha as the venue of its college one would have expected the institution to be planted in Erumu, Jengri, Ihe, or one of these cities and villages where there was already adequate number of converts who could be employed to support the dream. Those who were making the decision on the location could have also considered the availability of infrastructure and facilities such as steady electrical supply, good roads, medical facilities, postal services in places such as Ibadan, Lagos, Jos, or Aba, Elisha was the very opposite of this requirement, as the town lacked all these basic facilities. The fact that 63 years after the founding of Aqua at Elisha, there is still an announcement for people to stay indoors because of the night ritual and secret festivals in the town speaks volumes about the serious status of the traditional beliefs in the town at the time. It is said that there was once a prediction that an important educational institution will miraculously be established in the town. Chief Obafemi Awolo, first premier of Western Nigeria, had the power of citing the region's university in Ijebu Rema, but he chose to find the university at Ileife, considered as the cradle of Yoruba civilization, to as a mark of respect to the Yoruba race. We must believe that the people entrusted with the search for a stable place for citing the first higher edu ed education institution were divinely led to Elisha. This is because Elisha was by no means the first location considered by the search team 
read by Roger Kuhn. The search team was at Ogere, Iperu, and Ijebode because these, these cities and towns met the four conditions set for the location of the proposed aqua, namely that the location must not be far away from big cities, that it must have electricity nearby, it must be middle way between Lagos and Ibadan, and the land must be up to 300 acres. As fate will have it, neither of these initial proposed locations could guarantee the availability of land for the project. On arrival at nearby Elysian, the Olofi and his people promptly welcomed the proposal and made available some piece of land. Kuhn and his team thereafter recommended the siting of the college at Elysian with the hope that the institution would serve as a beacon of light in a location where there were few Christians and even fewer Adventists. Approval was given to the recommendation and thus began the life of Aqua. Church officials began the clearing of the forest and the erection of the first building of the institution started. What followed was the beginning of the academic session in September 1959 with the enrollment of seven students aged 20 to 39 with four of them married and all the seven were consecrated students. They were hosted in a private house owned by Chief Olufemi Okulaja. What is not yet properly explained is the reason for the use of college for the new institution. Was the reason for the founding of the Elysian Institution the same as that of the Ethiopian Adventist College? This issue is of considerable interest because many of the higher education institutions all over the world bear the name ceremony, a seminary. Some, chose, some choose the combination of college and seminary, such as the Bangladesh Adventist Seminary and College in Dakar. Bangladesh, or the Manila Adventist College, per se, Philippines. Perhaps you should not indulge in the luxury of engaging in the study of names and descriptions of institutions. Indeed, Professor Edward Augustus Freeman, Regis Professor of Modern History at Oxford University, was advised, and I quote, those perhaps are wise who decline to define at all. End of quotation. What should be of interest is the quality of programs offered by Aqua and later Aswa, either as a college or a seminary. It is indeed instructive to know that it was while Aqua was still a college that he successfully secured in January 1975 the affiliation agreement with Andrews University in Michigan, United States, which made the degrees and diplomas awarded at Elysian become legal tender of Andrews University. In any case, Aqua later got abolished as a name when it was converted to a seminary following the decision of the military government of Nigeria to take over all the schools and college in the country from 1975. The SDA authorities had quickly responded to that move by declaring that their own college was a seminary. That was how Aqua was transformed into Aswa. There was little change in admission requirements although there was an increase in programs offered by the institution. Impact of Aqua and Aswa. Aqua was a dream come true, as it provided the higher education programs in theology, business studies, and the practical skills in crafts, carpentry, agriculture, and other areas required by the society. Aqua and Aswa was able to produce graduates of Andros University on the shores of Nigeria, who were trained as committed missionaries and workers. The college and the seminary engaged the services of the educated members of the church, so that D.T. Agbola, J.D. Awoni from Nigeria, J.C. Winslow, R.W. Kuhn, Haman Bauman from the United States. The emergence of these pioneer teachers began the tradition of recruiting committed teachers to the institution, and of the teachers investing their skills and talents in the work of the college and seminary, teaching and writing, developing the innate talents of the students. Aqua also gave publicity to the college by invite, inviting eminent Nigerians to address students. It does engage the world on such issues such as politics. For example, just two years after its establishment, the college invited Chief Obafemi Awolowo, the first premier of Western Nigeria and the leader of opposition, to speak on religion and politics. The tradition of bringing distinguished Nigerians has been sustained by the succeeding institutions of Aswa and Babcock. For example, 
President Olushe Obasanjo has remained a frequent visitor to Babcock University, which evolved from Akwa and Aswa. The university also attracted Professor Kinsley Mugalu, former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria and President of the Institute for Governance and Economic Transformation, who delivered the 2020 Convocation Lecture with Obasanjo as special guest at the lecture. Aqua and its successor institutions have been able to put into practical realization the principles of the Christian full education, full education as proposed by LNG White, and known to the indigenous society, did not encourage compartmentalization of learning as the body, soul, and spirit are taken care of. And I quote her, true education means more than the postwell of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of higher, wider service in the world to come. Oswald Chambers adds that the education received must be geared towards uncompromising dedication to live holy. The Christian must make the pursuit of holiness the focus of living. Never tolerate through sympathy with yourself or with others any practice that is not in keeping with the holy God. Holiness means unsolid walking with the feet, unsolid talking with the tongue, unsolid walking with the mind, every detail of the life under scrutiny of God. Products of Aswa, Aqua and Aswa were intentionally made to use their head, heart, and hands simultaneously, and if possible, have the hands made dirty to resolve problems and challenges at all levels of development at the home, the wider community, and the international global village. Aqua bread and peanuts became household commodity in many homes and have been transferred to Aswa and BU. Students were made to choose the better option of living, fighting for, for justice, and caring for the neighbors. They were also made to appreciate the love of God expressed through the gift of his son to mankind through the path of suffering and, sh and shame on the cross to give mankind life and salvation from sin. They were to be different from the society, remaining a remnant, the light of the world, recipients of the promise of God with the unique style of livelihood, in dress, attitude, and life expectations and priorities. They were reminded to seek the kingdom, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and that all other things will be added to them, Matthew 6, 33. All of them were groomed to serve as, for example, Johnson Adeniji, who, who attended Aqua from 1962 to 1966, and obtained a degree in theology, became president of West Nigeria Mission of the SDA. His success in office, his successor in office, David was also a student of Aqua from 1966 to 1960, and equally obtained a degree of arts in theology. Yet another successor to the office, Jayola, was also a product of both Aqua and Aswa. It is important to note that the alumni of Aqua and Aswa have remained the pillar of support to the work of the church, serving as teachers and administrators and holding positions as division and at the division and general conference levels, union and conference presidents, chair of governing councils of SD institutions of higher learning. They have remained evangelists to the world. In the meantime, the almighty God was at work without consulting anyone, moving Aqua and Aswa to a higher plane, to a higher level. Since he is sovereign, he makes things work according to his own purpose and plans. Psalm 115, verse 3. Engineering BU. The next phase was made possible by the incessant industrial disputes, leading to persistent strikes in public universities and the troubled times which followed the annulment of the 1993 elections and the sudden death of Sonia Abacha and MK Wabiola. These developments are led to the emergence of General Abdul Salam as head of the military government. Abdul Salam was clearly in a hurry to leave the seat of power and get out of the scene. He was also eager 
to solve as many outstanding challenges as possible, which he inherited. One of his acts was to allow private universities to be established. As soon as this possibility of private institutions to be licensed to operate became known to the authority of Aswa, the seminaries' authorities acted. Aswa was confident that with its history of producing graduates in collaboration with Andrews University, and it quickly grabbed the opportunity and applied. Government was unwilling to accept registrations of the universities with names of churches, missions, or religious institutions, and so it was not ready to register the Adventist University. It, however, accepted the suggestion to name the institution after Babcock, the pioneer Adventist missionary to Nigeria. The application was successful, and Babcock University came into being as one of the first set of private universities in Nigeria. Babcock University provided the full opportunity for higher education for the Adventist community and upgraded the Aqua and Aswa. Perhaps more decisive has been the opening of the Advent message and the three angels' message of remaining faithful to the end to those peoples, students, their parents, and the wider public to those outside the Adventist community. The idea was to use the university to prepare people for skill and attitude at the university level, while at the same time introduce the staff and students to the knowledge of the love of Jesus and the requirements for the second coming of Jesus. It is of course known that it is by no means a man, it, 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 was, that it, it is of course known that it is by no means a man or institution that converts as conversion is the exclusive preserve of the almighty God of creation above. The duty of the Christian is to present the information and evidence of the saving grace of Jesus and allow people to make their choices. It is so refreshing to hear other members of the Christian denominations and those of other faiths greet themselves happy Sabbath and responding happy day. This can only be God at work. The gospel of the salvation of Jesus is preached everywhere and every time and every season, just as the Lord will be pleased to know. The point has been repeatedly made that increasingly the Elysian experiment helps staff and students who may never have heard about SDA mission and work to come in touch directly with the church and its activities and programs. As Babcock continues to attract programs and projects, that pull people to them, fresh opportunities are provided for the promotion of the mission of the church, which is to prepare people for the second coming of the Lord Jesus, the advent of the Son of God, Savior of the world. The following table shows that the percentage of the Seventh-day Adventist students admitted to University, Babcock University to the non-Seventh-day Adventist students has ranged from 23.5 to 76.5, in 2002-2003 session, 21.6 to 78.4 in 2008-2009, and 4.5 to 95.5 in the 2021-22 session. The table is shown. Babcock is a group institution, diverse and sensitive to diversity. It maintains a balance in its recruitment of students along the gender lines, as shown in the table above. It's also one of the few universities which have succeeded in, um, in maintaining and sustaining diversity in student and staff recruitment. Its approval of programs and courses come not only from the national accreditation bodies, such as the Nigerian National Universities Commission, NUC, and professional bodies, but also from the Adventist Accrediting Association, AAA, the international body which derives its authority from the Global Seventh-day Adventist General Conference and the regional body in Ivory Coast. It is resolved not to compromise its mission of helping everyone who is connected to the Christian life and livelihood. It respects the local content of life, not discriminatory about admission, staff recruitment, bringing in non-Christians, non-Adventist Christians of all races, creed, and religion as one community. Its focus is on quality of provision in learning and character. 
on quality of learning, BU ensured that the quality of programs, teaching and learning remained very high. For example, it was noted that students of the university with a second class upper division degrees in law were awarded the first class classification in the law school. Alumni are reported to excel in different areas as reported by the present vice chancellor at convocation. Building the future. In the field of futuristic study, there is often an attempt to identify some indices that may help to predict the future. There is also the saying that history is repeating itself in some cases. When it comes to the discussion of the future of Babcock University, we may profitably look back and see the constant features of dedication, faith, hope, and commitment. We are still left with the need to have a clear understanding of the forces that have helped the institution grow so astronomically and sustainably. Prayers, committed leadership, sensitivity, sensitivity to the need of students, staff, parents, the host community, and all stakeholders, local and international, and consistently prudent management of the limited resources available to the university, which does not benefit from government stipends and budgetary allocation. There is a plausible explanation that all that has happened with Aqua, Aswa, and BU has been determined and crafted by the invisible God, the creator and maker of the world, the almighty God who chose to build the institution, laid its foundation, selected the leaders at every level of governance and administration, and is resolved to make the institution a demonstration of his goodness and mercy to mankind. It has been the God who has chosen the leaders and inspired the prayers, brought help from afar and near, and given it the hope to continue to translate its vision to the mission that drives the institution. We should therefore conclude that the fingers of God have determined the course of the institution. The Almighty God has remained with the initial experiment in higher education provision since its inception and the source of the creative development of programs, policy, and progress. How else will one explain the phenomenal progress and accomplishments of the heritage Aqua and Aswa and the transformed BU? With a period of 63 years, we have had a student enrollment jump from seven in 1959 to 11,051 in 2021. From a program in theology in 1959, there are now programs in almost all facets of learning. In addition to the progress in programs, there have been progress in student enrollment, start development, and local and national international recognition. While Aqua graduated 1,000 students and Aswa graduated 1,645 students from 1976 to, 19, to 2002, BU students' enrollment for the 2021 to 2022 session stood at 11,051 students. Change and development have thus been a permanent, irreversible feature of the institutions. Even when the institution has come under intense pressure and faced what will appear to be ordin to the ordinary mind as insurmountable challenges, the Lord's faithfulness has spoken and intervened. This was the story when government wanted to take on the ownership of the colleges, and the Lord had inspired the college authorities to declare that the college was conceived as a seminary which was not to be taken over by government. The story had repeated itself when there was a stall in the proposal for the affiliation of the seminary with the University of Ibadan. It was at that very hour that the Lord engineered the process for the establishment of private universities, with Babcock being among the pioneer universities under that dispensation of grace. We should quickly make the point that the establishment of Aqua, Aswa, and BU has redeemed the image of the SDA which was once portrayed as a mission that is reluctant to encourage and promote the educational growth of Nigerians. The assumptions have been made that the church has been less enthusiastic about the pursuit of education and producing a crop of educated elite like other Christian missions. 
Indeed, there was some suspicion that the church had been one of the institutions which had used education to further destroy the confidence of the Africans in themselves by adapting the school curriculum to suit primitive objectives of education. Suddenly, and most unexpectedly, Babcock University emerged and became one of the first set of private universities licensed by the federal government as a private university. Other missions such as Baptist later came to Babcock University to learn how to process the application for the establishment of private universities such as Bowen University in Iwo, Ocean State. Babcock University has also vigorously continued to offer access to education at the secondary school level, establishing the Babcock High Schools all over Nigeria, thus expanding access to learning at the pre-university level. It's indeed possible that Babcock University could export the Babcock High School brand outside the Nigeria overseas. Babcock has also raised the bar of higher education performance higher, high as the university has become a brand with its alumni able to raise their heads tall in the increasingly competitive global world. Babcock University is uncompromisingly committed to the promotion of quality and pursuit of excellence and its policy and practice in the field of staff development and recruitment and Babcock staff holding key positions, leading positions, vice chancellor of the university in Cameroon, head of the ICT in Kenya for many years before returning to Babcock again. The university has programmed its alumni in confidence building learning to be bold, courage, dedicated, audacity of hope, never accepting defeat, but trusting the Lord for his faithfulness that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. One of the early students of the Department of Music is the globally celebrated musician and performer, Davido. Some of the other alumni that are listed include Samuel Lamide, an international security expert, Beverly Olsu, a distinguished model and actress. The convocation, ad convocation addresses of the president's vice chancellors carry testimonies of the breakthrough of Babcock staff and students locally and globally. Babcock has introduced, amen. Babcock has introduced programs re relevant to all aspects of national development, medicine, law, science, humanities, agriculture, nursing, economics, accounting, and all subjects aimed at contribution contributing to national development and global issues. Babcock University is determined never to be stagnant. It therefore, through its colloquium, seminars, regular talk, and shared views within and without the walls of the university, engages in the search for strategies for continuing growth and development, exploration of new ways of doing things, and new ideas and strategies, more prayers, more reflection, and action. It is important to note that the slogan for Babcock University is the future is bright. This means that the university is not committed to continued search for relevance and development. It is deliberately and intentionally focused on grooming all those under its influence for the bright future, producing a safe and prosperous, contented people, and at the same time engaged in their preparation beyond the known, visible and tangible for the unknown, invisible and the intangible world, which will end in eternity. There is still so much left for the seeds of 63 elision experiment and the bulk of the 23 offsprung to be done. One of the areas of concern is the continued practice of sacrifice offered outside, uh, outside the complete sacrifice effected by the Son of God at Calvary. As Dosumu has observed, there are still Africans who still hold a supernatural and spiritualistic worldview, visit diviners, shamans, spiritualistic Kabbalists and the traditional medicine men and women who use, for example, enchantments, divination, charms, and invocation of the spirit world. They engage in such practices for various reasons, which included the diagnosis and treatment of various ailments, both physical and psychological, which plague their clients, exhibit a quest to know the future through divination, and are familiar with the preparation of different kinds of charms and medicines. Christians, including some Yoruba Adventists, are reported to be engaged in such wisdom and divination in the missionary expeditions among the Egba, a sub-tribe in, in the 19th century. Dosumu concludes that, and I quote him, 
Dual allegiance is a significant issue in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that needs a concerted effort to both detect and eliminate, eliminate it from the practice of the believers. A major emphasis is needed on the power of the gospel. Babcock University has been held by the recent decision of the General Conference of the SDA to establish the Study Center for African Traditional Religions and Worldviews. The practical way the center and any related program will respond to the need to make the world respond comprehensively to the gospel of Christ should continue to be a preoccupation of Babcock University in addition to the production of people to meet the national needs for development. It seems obvious that there is need for revival and rededication to the vision of the 63 and the 23, and the need for a renewed commitment. The rededication must begin from within the individual, and we require the help from above for strength and mercy to be able to make the necessary progress. The spiritual assistance will also impact the services in all the professions and activities established to meet the needs of the new global digital age. Lessons to be learned from the story of Babcock University. The first is that it pays to be dedicated to the service of God. Babcock made enormous sacrifice, determined to do God's will, even in hardship and discomfort. Leaving the developed nations of Europe and America, he gave up all comfort to be able to meet the injunction of God to go to all nations with the message of the hope in Jesus. His story is that of total surrender as all what Chambers was later to remark of the missionaries of his age. Our Lord is our example in the life of self-sacrifice. I delight to do thy will, O my God. He went on with his sacrifice with exuberant joy. Have I ever yielded in absolute submission to Jesus Christ? If Jesus Christ is not the low star, there is no benefit in the sacrifice. But when the sacrifice is made with the eyes on him, Slowly and surely, the molded influence begins to tell. Elder David Babcock worked for only three years in Nigeria, the country that decided to immortalize his name and reward his pioneering trailblazing efforts in introducing the salvation of God in a new dimension to Nigerians. The issue is not the length of service rendered, but in the effectiveness and efficiency of work done and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There has also been the important factor of the tradition of obedience to constituted authority which has served ordained ministers get to the level of the leadership of the 6323 institution, be it Roja Kuhn or Mackenzie, Alalade, Mackenzie or Tayo. It's been a continuum of idea, ideas and ideas. Thank God for the road named after Kuhn and the administrative block named after Alalade the last president of Aswa and pioneer president of vice chancellor of BU. It's not yet known what edifice or edifices will be named after Kayo de Makinde, the ebullient, ravishing go-getter, and second president, vice chancellor of BU, or after Tayo, the quiet achiever and uncompromising policy bound te technocrat when they step aside from the 6323 chain of institutions. The second lesson. The second lesson is the reward for creativity, industry, resilience of planners. I recall the demonstration of steadfastness of Professors Kayode Makinde and Gbenga Idowu, whom I once met in 2000 at an odd period by the office of Professor Tunde Adeniran, the then Minister of Education, who ushered them in and got to know what their mission was with respect to the establishment of the new Babcock University. It has been that drive of never say never that has said Babcock achieved the almost impossible with limited fund and unprecedented level of growth and development as everyone can see all the time at Babcock University. Another lesson is the wisdom employed in dealing with constituted authority. When government decided to take over schools, Adventist College of West Africa was converted to seminary and became Adventist Seminary of West Africa and began to produce graduates in affiliation with Andrews University in the United States. Work proceeded calmly and efficiently without disruption. There was no confrontation with government. 
when government decided to deny the graduates of seminary access to youth service programs, the Lord opened heavens and translated the seminary to a university, Aswa, to, to BU. The institutions have steadily been partners with government in the production of human capital for development and nation building. A further lesson is that the Lord answers prayers. This is the story of Bacock. As the Almighty God opened his heavens to the institution at every face and turn, the God of Israel did not ask, allow Aswa as an educational institution to be put to shame in the face of government takeover and the reluctance of local universities to accept Aswa at affiliate college. Miraculously, heavens opened and have since remained opened. The strategy employed by Bacock University in witnessing about Jesus to members of community deserves commendation. This takes the form of programs and talks, songs and entertainment, and chaplains and ministers are deployed. There is, however, no compulsion or force. Rather, there is respect for other faiths. Babcock University Division of Spiritual Development explores innovative ways of introducing the Sabbath worship to staff and students in the university who may be coming across the unusual and hitherto unknown approach to worship. There are methods involving participation and sharing of vision and ideas that keep the process and activities from being boring. Rather, the students are encouraged to celebrate the Sabbath worship as part of the demand of Christian living. For indeed, as Matilda Frey has put it, the reason for Sabbath observance is the view that man has to see from work on the Sabbath day in order for holiness to enter the world for the benefit of all humanity. Such holiness is key to Christian living, and without holiness, man cannot see God. It is easy to make students and staff appreciate the element of holiness as the essence of the divine human relationship. Conversion is not vigorously pursued, and students and staff are free to register for programs that could lead to baptism. Another lesson learned is that there is no limit to breakthroughs that can emanate from prayers and complete faith in the Lord through his son Jesus. It is to be expected that more prayers will attract more programs and more faith will open heavens to individuals and the general community. Appreciation. I must thank the Almighty God for this privilege to serve as the 2022 Founders Day speaker. Again, I am con conscious of the fact that it is a special favor and a further demonstration of the special favor to me by the Lord who has consistently spoken to my situation with his words that he does not call the qualified and only qualifies the called. He has shown mercy to me and answered my prayers contained in Psalm 109, verses 26 and 27, and I quote, Help me, O Lord, my God, O save me according to thy mercy, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou hast done it. He has helped me write this text, which I dedicate to the Holy Spirit, my gentle companion, and to my Savior and Redeemer, Jesus my Lord. I should congratulate the Founders Day Planning Committee, led by Professor Jacob Aliso, the university's senior vice president, deputy vice chancellor, SVP management services, for his wisdom of accepting the use of the rear view mirror approach of looking back to explore the factors that have shaped the course of the development of higher education institution. For, as Ellen G. White once advised in the familiar say, we have nothing to fear for the future, except that we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in our past history. We know that the past is used by wise people as guides to plan. For as the African proverb puts it, when the young person skips, he or she looks in front to identify the reason for the skipping. But when the old person skips, the old person looks back to identify the circumstances and situation that have led to the fall. The planning committee is also conscious of the need not just to continue looking back without the wisdom of charting a course for the future. For as prophet Isaiah clearly counsels, and I quote Isaiah, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall spring forth. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. 
we are lucky that the 6323 story can be told with the use of the rich materials available on the subject. The honor to a historian is to give the lecture is no doubt the honor to a historian to give the lecture is no doubt a recognition of the status of the institution's Department of History and International Studies, which has the mandate to vigorously promote the study of history. In an age when history was tragically expunged from school curriculum and historical fabrications, distortions, and inventions find the way, find some space as a monster on the social media, the appreciation of the work of the department will be considerable encouragement. I would like to note that I owe so much to many people during my association with Aqua, Aswa, and the BU Miracle Journey. It's therefore difficult for me to single out individuals without missing out so many others. Nevertheless, I need to mention just a few, perhaps for emphasis. I'm grateful to the chairman and members of the Founders Day Planning Committee for the opportunity given me to reflect and share my views on the topic. I want to appreciate Professor Jacob Haliso, who is, as chairman of the committee, conveyed the pleasant news of my selection to present the lecture to me when I was away in distant land. I should recall the courtesy that he had earlier extended to me when he was provost of the College of Postgraduate School to deliver the inaugural multidisciplinary lecture at the college in the pre-COVID years. My gratitude goes to Professor James Kyle de Mackinde, known for his usual enthusiasm to attract anyone whom he considers capable of being an asset to the institution, invited me back to Babcock University as member of the Board of Trustees and later staff of the university. It has been left to Professor Ademola Stephen Tayo to graciously retain me, approving my nomination as a member of the inaugural lectures committee of the university, and constantly encouraging and releasing me to undertake national and national international assignments. His support for this lecture is additional reason for my profound gratitude to the chief executive of the university and his team of principal officers and advisors. I want to thank Professor David Babalola, who as president of West Nigeria Conference of the SDA, nominated me following my election as dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Badon to serve from 1987 on the governing council of the Adventist Seminary for West Africa under the leadership of Pastor Norti, the Ghanaian president of the Africa and Indian Ocean Division of the SDA with Professor Adekunle Alaladi as president. I'm grateful to the ministers and pastors at all the churches and places of my worship for their advice, prayers, and encouragement. For the conducive environment for working during the evening of my working life, I must appreciate the deans, professors Amanze, Ogunji, and Adeshegun, heads of departments, especially Dr. Pokwola of History Department, colleagues, staff, and students at the School of Education and Humanities, EH, who have stood by me in the course of my work. I thank Dr. Jonathan Dangana, director of the Babcock University Alumni Relations Office, who responded swiftly and at short notice to my urgent request for the statistics required to make some points in this presentation as presenter in the table. I'm also grateful to colleagues from the Department of History and International Studies, especially Drs. Alex Ugukwa and Emmanuel Eregari, for helping with some information required for the writing of the paper. My references also indicate the extent of my indebtedness to church historians, local and international, and other stakeholders who have been part of the journey of Aqua, Aswa, and BU. I must declare that the invitation to me to make this presentation has reconfirmed my belief that we have all as individuals, families, communities, and nations entered our season of perfect jubilee of restoration, deliverance, rehabilitation, and new beginning under the leadership of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is our season of celebration, like the experience of the people of Israel after the miraculous end of the siege of the Syrians in 2 Kings chapter 7. The Bible reports that the lepers who discovered the flight of the powerful Syrian army, and I quote, then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. 
and we hold our peace. Second Kings chapter 7, verse 9. We need to celebrate the goodness of God in the story of Aqua, Aswa, and Bangkok University, the 63-23 experience. Please let me conclude by reminding us all that the same God who brought Elder Babcock to Nigeria in 1914 remains the same God guiding the affairs of the university. For the Bible tells source of the assurance of God that, and I quote, I am God, I change not. Thank you and God bless you. We have listened to the uh, Founders Day lecturer in his characteristic manner of diligence, insight, and expertise. He has given us so much as food for thought to serve as a guided compass for our beliefs, not only as Adventists, but as educators and workers. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite to discuss the topic some of our eggheads here. May I invite, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Abiodun Adeshegun, please can you come forward? Professor Sisi Uwonzu, please can you come forward? <laughs> Mrs. Modupe Ido, please can you also come forward? <laughs> and Dr. Sunday Audu. Come forward. These will serve as panelists to further give flesh to the lecture that has just been delivered. And now hand over the microphone to the moderator of this session, Professor Abiodun Adeshegun. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me appreciate the lecturer of the day, Emeritus Professor Michael Abiola Omolewa, who incidentally is my academic father because he was the one who facilitated my admission into the University of Ibadan in 1984 for a master's degree. Subsequently, he also assisted other ASWA graduates, like Professor Chimeze Omeonu, uh, Professor Jeme Oyinloye, Pastor H.B. Smith, and many others, who actually were with him in the Faculty of Education, where he was dean 
from 1985 onwards. Thank you, sir, for your mentorship. Let me also acknowledge, I can see only one of them here now, one of our teachers when we were students at Aswa. Seated in, our, in the audience is Professor Joshua Adeyeye. He was our biology teacher back in the day. He and Professor Sheyo Duyoye came to Aswa as young men, unmarried, they were our teachers, and we, we admired them. And of course, here on the panel with me is someone that we envied at the time because he was a student instructor. She was a student instructor in typing and typewriting and uh, an English. And she also taught us, she taught our fellow students, Professor Sisi Wosu. Thank you for your work. We have listened to the erudite lecture presented to us by Emeritus Professor Molewa. In fact, the vistas that were opened to us through his delivery are such that as if we have never even heard of the history of Aswa, Aqua, and uh, Babcock University before. Let me just throw some light because I observed that he was asking the question about why was the place named the college at Exemption on September 17, 1959. The reason was because the purveyors of that idea wanted to establish a liberal arts college, just like those in the United States of America, the climb in which they knew and they came from. Uh, Grover C. Winslow, if I may quote one of the letters that he wrote to the government of that time stated that, apart from theology, and I quote, we need permission to offer an undergraduate degree program in business administration and secretarial science, commencing with the 1960-61 academic year, if possible. So that was the initial dream and the reason that the college was going to be a liberal arts college that will offer other things apart from theology. One of the points that we may also note is that it's encapsulated in the same letter that they wrote to the government, which is the basis of Seventh Adventist education worldwide. It says, and I quote, that our institution, talking of ACWA, measure up to the highest standards of entrance requirements, curriculum, physical plant, and teaching facilities, and in any other way possible, unquote. So you can see that right from his early days, the Adventist College of West Africa within his poor view, had the pursuit of excellence in teaching and learning. And so we want to quickly look at that as we progress through the Aqua Aswa and BU years. We will spend more time on the BU years, of course, because that is where we are at now. How far, Professor Nwosu, would you agree that um, back then and even now, we have met the highest standards of entrance requirements, curriculum, physical plant, and teaching facilities. Thank you, um, Professor Adeshegu. And I want to first of all thank 
Professor Nolowa for this um, history. I was um, really, I was overwhelmed. I said, how many days did it take him to do this? Did he sleep at all? May the Lord continue to bless you, sir. And um, coming to the question that you asked me, I want to thank God for the opportunity to speak. I'm trying to remember the name of this author who said that did Jim, oh no, the, the, the last name has ended me, but he says that the day you say you have arrived, your downfall has started right then. So I cannot say that we have achieved 100% um, our goal, but I can say that we have continued to grow. As he was making this presentation this morning, my mind went to the Aswa days when we were not only, th we, we were not completely theory focused. We participated in uh, many, many, many activities, hands on. I remember that uh, if you needed to pass uh, music and art appreciation, you needed to engage in other um, activities, where either, whether you took them as credits or you, 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 you participated on a work study program or community service where we came out and we did many activities. I learned molding blocks on this campus. And, and, and we learned typing. I was telling a group of students the other day, I said, it amazes me that you take your work to people to type for you. And when your teacher dictates problem, you tell them, you tell your teacher that you didn't type it. It was somebody who types. And so you push the blame on, that, on those persons. And I remember that when we were here as students, you could, if, 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 you, if someone else typed your work for you, 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 it was grounds enough for you to fail that class because you must learn how to type. You must uh, do things for yourself. So why I applaud our, um, how far we have gone in ability to remaining quality institutions. I think that in the area of um, um, hands-on, we have been a little bit negligent, either because m many of our curriculum now is drawn from the government NUC, and we don't have much um, uh, space to include some of the things that we wanted, but I really wish that we could go back and begin to think about some of those areas where we are lacking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is interesting because the work study program was an integral part of uh, uh, Adventist education in the Aqua Aswa days. Today, if you ask a student to come and do work study, they may frown at it and think that you are saying something quite different because they feel that if they don't lack money and they can pay their school fees and go around, why would they want to do work study? But let me just give a little anecdote before I allow Dr. Sunday Audu to respond to this. Uh, there is a famous man in the UK called Oswald Boateng. He's a Ghanaian. Studied computer science. So the day he finished his uh, program, he took his uh, degree diploma and went to his parents and said, you asked me to study computer science. Here is your certificate. The mother was a seamstress. She was so close. And because she, he was the one at home, he was always assisting his mother. So he decided that this was what he wanted to do for life. So he began fashion designing. And before you know it, he became so famous that he is on Seville Row. Seville Row is the number one address for clothes in the whole world. If they said you got your suit from Seviro, that means you have spent thousands of pounds in acquiring that dress. And Oswald Barteng sold suits for prime ministers of Britain, celebrities and people, and he is a multi-millionaire now in pounds because of his own vision. So what will you say to somebody even today, that says this work study 
or learning another thing apart from the classroom experience is not the way to go. Well, it's uh, the lecturer um, emphasized on that aspect of the philosophy of a Seventh-day Adventist education, that of training not only the head and the heart, but that of training the hand also. Uh, today, I, I think in Aswa days, in the days of Aswa, there were uh, uh, skills outlined, even in the bulletin, where people can learn so many things besides the academic activities they came here for. Uh, now, one of the ways to gather experience uh, besides or outside of those outlined and regulated skill sets is to get involved in work study. Uh, oftentimes, the young people fail to realize that rather than wasting their energy blaming employers of labor for prospective jobs they are applying for, uh, you see, you see, must be aged 26, 27 by December 31st and must have two years work experience. Uh, so sometimes they begin to place curses on those employers uh, with whom they desire to work. They say, where would one get two years work experience just graduating from university? They fail to realize that having done two, three years of work study on campus, you can cite that on your CV as a work experience. Uh, so we really need to uh, redirect the minds of the young ones, thinking or feeling that those who engage in work study are those uh, that lack money or they need money. Uh, for example, if I were to work um, in the bursary as a student assistant, I would cite my CV, I would cite it on my CV while aspiring to work in a bank that I have experience in managing financial records and the uh, allocation of resources in a complex organization, a universal organization, something like that. So when they press you a little bit further, you can actually submit that it was in a university. Uh, so, but I think the work study program, uh, we should encourage it and sustain it because it um, gives the needed experience that can come handy in the future when such will need it. So it's part of um, our philosophy. It's part of what we should sustain and uphold. And um, especially for the Seventh-day Adventist students, it becomes uh, it's a tough situation. Records from the Human Resources um, Department will indicate that a good or a higher percentage of those who engage in work study are the non-Seventh-day Adventist students, surprisingly. The records are there uh, to check. So we have a task uh, before us, and uh, we need to encourage that. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Dewey, I'm coming back to you. You can hold the microphone now. Um, in responding to him, you can just add this to it. We had the statistics given by the emeritus professor with regards to the ratio of Adventist students as against non-Adventist students on our campus presently. Is that a disadvantage? I want you to note these questions I'm asking. Secondly, even if it is not a disadvantage, what can we do to boost the number of Adventists that we have? Thirdly, having 11,500 students, are they not a captive audience for the gospel to really help us to go out there to do all that we can to win them for Christ, both in character and learning. Because you hear some of these students say, well, your teachings are good, but you don't behave well. Your teachings are at variance with your conduct. What, what will you prefer as a solution to that? Thank you very much, Professor Adeshegu. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here this morning, and I would like to appreciate our Professor Emeritus 
for the outstanding presentation you gave. I learned a lot from that presentation. Thank you for being always there for us, sir. La the third statement you actually made, Professor, has answered the first question. I rather believe that the large number of non-Adventist students in our midst is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for us to witness, for us to be able to carry out the mission for which the church uh, has been raised. The Adventist has been raised to carry out the mission of Christ to the entire world. And so having these students come into our campus is a great opportunity. And uh, secondly, uh, you mentioned about what we can do to raise the number of uh, Adventist students. It is in the opportunity that we have to witness to these students that we raise the number of Adventists on campus. Yes, the fees are very high, and I think the university is doing a lot to accommodate the uh, seeming disadvantage of the Adventist uh, community by uh, providing the work-study program and also the heritage fund for the Adventists, whereby the university gives them an amount to augment the uh, school fees. And uh, also, I think uh, by way of the quota system that the university uses in admitting students, it's another way to ensure the uh, to increase in the number of Adventists on campus. Now, we briefly go back to the response that uh, Dr. Aoudou uh, made to the issue of uh, asking students, or maybe a student asking uh, us why we do work study program. I think we should not really wait for any student to ask us that, that question. Why am I saying that? Yes, it is true that our university is committed to relevance and development, but I think there is more we can do. The seventh and, uh, but not the least, of our core values stresses the importance of uh, Adventist heritage as, it says, Adventist heritage is our commitment. And when we talk about commitment, we are talking about an obligation, something that we must do, something that we must stress. But uh, when we look at what is happening in our midst, yes, we are making effort. I think there is much more we can do in this area by uh, helping our students to understand who we stand for. At, uh, during the, um, we were in the SPIM at one time, and one of the students that was, uh, uh, we were, had an issue that was brought to SPIM said, well, I don't really see the difference between us and these people. They may be, they worship on Saturday, and that's all. But there is much more to us than just merely worshiping on Saturday. To a large extent, even our own children, those who are born in Adventist homes, do not know why they're Adventist, many of them. So I think we need to understand that to some extent, in as much as we are, we are raising young people and we are making them relevant uh, in the area of development, you know, uh, innovation and so on and so forth, we need to be mindful of raising a generation that is ignorant of the way the Lord has led us and his teaching is in our past history. That we should not slide into uh, mass amnesia about our heritage. Our heritage is key. It is an obligation. It's an obligation for us to communicate our heritage to our young people. Maybe I'll quickly make mention of uh, the book of Matthew 27, verses 37 to 38, that says, it was Jesus speaking. He says, talking about the end time, the world will be at ease banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the dense sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them away. So shall my coming be. What are we saying in essence? 
we are at the tail end of the world's history. And these young people that come to our campus must get to know this. Whichever way we must let them know, we have to factor them into the system. And I'm glad by the introductory uh, welcoming address of the Vice Chancellor, when he says that the time has come when we have to infuse this into our curriculum. I think we have to find a way to bring in Adventist heritage into our curriculum. As I'd been rightly said, there is, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in, in, in his teachings in our past history. So it is our responsibility, uh, sir, to work towards developing Adventist perspective on life and lead students to apply the Adventist worldview in all situations of life. And it, as it was said on page nine of the lecture that was given, which is what we carry, is much more than a pursuance of certain course of study. It is, it means more than preparation for this life, whatever kind of vocation a student is geared towards. It has to do with the whole being, the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, mental, and spiritual power. So in either essence, we need to take stock and see which aspect are we really developing the most. Is it the physical? How about the, I mean, is it the mental? How about the physical? What are we doing? Are we intentional in ensuring that they develop in this area? What about the spiritual? Yes, we go to church on Sabbath and all the other days, but what else can we do? So I believe there is much more we can do that we help our young people learn these things by themselves as we interact with them instead of waiting for them to ask those questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. As a rider to your contribution, we know that Bapo University is within a global community and the institution must continue to seek relevance so that it can keep its doors open at all times and continue to do business. That is the business of Jesus. How do we ensure that, um, Professor Sisi Wosu, how do we ensure that our quest for global relevance does not conflict with our identity at the same time? Or are the two mutually exclusive? Thank you very much. And I would like to, if you don't mind, go back to add a little um, strength to what uh, Ms. Ido has just finished saying. I was, um, when Professor, Emeritus Professor Molewa was making his presentation on page 10 of his lecture, he said something that I quickly opened the book and marked it. He said the idea was to use, talking about engineering BU, talking about engineering BU, he said that the idea was to use the university to prepare people for skill and attitude at the university level, while at the same time introduce the staff and students to the knowledge of the love of Jesus and the requirements for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Wow, that actually touched me. And I quickly started asking myself, where are we on this today? He talked about skill, he talked about attitude, he talked about love of Jesus, that's evangelism, that, you know, so he talked about hands-on, he talked about head knowledge, he talked about heart knowledge. And the question is, um, talking about what Ms. Sido said, I think it's time that we said, especially starting with the Seventh-day Adventists, that we should make um, work study compulsory for them. If we don't have enough work on camp, pardon me? Yeah, for everybody, yes, but beginning with them in case, so that others will learn from them while we do that. And if we don't have enough work, we can do community service. In those days, we were doing We came out every Sunday, and our lecturers were our leaders, and we followed them to do community service. And we enjoyed it. It was a Sunday thing that everybody uh, wanted to be part of. I don't think anybody uh, ran away from that. We are talking about global relevance. Today in our world, um, there are lots of unemployment, and the people that are thriving today are those who can, you know, uh, those that are entrepreneurs, those who can do things for themselves. And in White uh, caution that it would be good 
that by the time any student left our campuses, those students will be able to use their hands. You know, they would have learned so much skill that when they go out there, instead of becoming, uh, waiting for employment, they'll become employ employers. So I don't think that will take us from being a global, uh, and in fact, we are a global church, and we're expecting a global final event, the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so even right now, whatever we are doing, we should be able to, we should be thinking of globalize, globalization because local relevance may not take us to where God wants us to be. So I'm thinking that the question you asked, we, being global is not a bad idea, but digressing from our mission is what is our problem, what is the danger that we find ourselves in. The fact that we are global is good, but we want to maintain those identities that would make our globalization even more relevant in our world today. Thank you. I'm told that our time is up. We can sum up this discussion by saying that there's a lot that we can thank God for in how far the Lord has led us. As you observe in the moderator in the lecture. Please just want to make Pardon? just want to make a brief comment. Okay. If Let I me have allow your you permission. To do that within one minute. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we thank the lecturer once again and our co-panelists. Um, on the issue of balancing the population or increasing the population of Seventh-day Adventists here, uh, you know, one way immediately to do it is for Seventh-day Adventists to give birth to more children. Um, you know, there is the qualitative aspect of increasing the population and the quantitative aspect. So the quantitative aspect is for us to give birth to more children. Uh, the qualitative aspect, uh, Mrs. Ido, who mentioned it, is for us to strengthen the commitment of our children and then to work towards reaching out to those who are here. I just looked at the statistics presented on page 11. Uh, you see by extrapolation, you look at it, the very first set uh, show 24% membership of Seventh-day Adventist students here. Now, by 2008, 2009, uh, uh, sorry, zero the troubler, uh, uh, 0809, we had 22%. You see a decline, but in number, the Seventh-day Adventists were 764 during the first set bracket up to 2003. By 2008, 2009, the population increased to 1143 but currently from the statistics we have five percent so look at it 24 percent 22 percent and then five percent 764 1143 and now 495 uh, so back to the first point i made which um, over which we laughed looking at it the first search of um, students that came in here when Babcock was chartered, we saw a huge population representing 24% coming in. Uh, by the mid-term period, 22%, uh, and now we have 5%. So back very seriously, could it be the Seventh-day Adventists have uh, stopped uh, giving birth to children? Uh, because uh, looking at it, those who are baptized here by the Heritage Award and other things captured do not qualify to be uh, so indicated. Uh, the heritage aspect is uh, looked at from the point of view of the uh, parents being Seventh-day Adventists. So let's look at it, uh, go back. Uh, I do believe the generation that graduated between 2008, 2009, they will work hard and give it a serious consideration. Um, I just want to bring, I'm from the North. Uh, the Muslims, uh, the Christians, looking at evangelism up North. Uh, the Christians spend money, millions, to build churches and to conduct evangelism, sometimes importing high-profile evangelists to preach to win souls for Christ. You know what the Muslims do? They simply give birth to the disciples. One Muslim, four wives, 38 disciples. Okay, one Christian, I think last Sabbath, uh, the preacher talked about permanent head damage. 
He was introduced as having five children, and the whole church became restless. So one Christian or one Adventist, one wife, uh, two and a half or one and a half children. And so we begin to struggle uh, with this. Uh, it sounds very light and funny, but we really need to look at it. And uh, for some of us, it's a little bit. So let's encourage our younger ones to do more. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have only 30 seconds. OK. Thank you very much. I, I thank you for the opportunity. I just want to bring us uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9, where it says God was talking to the children of Israel, and he was telling them that they should put his uh, pre commands, the precept that he has given, he says you should put it upon their heart, impress them on their children, talk about them when they sit at home, when they walk along the road, when they lie down, when they get up, tie them as symbols on their hands, bind them on their foreheads, write them on the door frames and houses of their houses and on their gates. This is talking about their heritage, that which God has passed down to them. What we need to do in order for us to be able to achieve our aim as Adventists is to employ this model. Communicate our heritage to every student on this campus. And one way we can do this is introducing the course Adventist Heritage in our curriculum. Through the course, these students will be able to uh, interact with the church, our mission, the reason, the, what lies at the core of Adventism, what are the driving forces behind the birth and growth of Adventism, what makes Adventism unique, those things that the, the essence of our existence can be communicated to them in this, uh, in the, in this uh, course. And they will be able, through this, come to know who we are and by the grace of God embrace us, embrace our, our teachings. Of course, it is Christ that changes lives, but it is our responsibility to avail these young people what God wants us to avail them. I want us to conclude, I want to conclude by saying, Mark chapter 8, verse 36 says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The souls of these children should be of utmost importance to us than whatever uh, educational or academic attainment that they may be. We conclude that Babcock University is God's own university. God has been helping us that in spite of our meager resources arising from this discussion, and we pray that God will help us to be able to get there. Thank you, and God bless you all. May I invite Professor Jacob Harlisov for the vote of thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Please uh, permit me to invite the President Vice Chancellor just for one minute comment. Thank you. Our Emeritus Professor, Professor Michael Abiola Omolewa, and the discussant Leonardo da Vinci once said, and I quote, anybody can make history, only a great man can write it. Emeritus Professor Omolewa not only made history, but he wrote history. And so, I want to join Leonardo da Vinci to say, without missing words, that you are a great man. Gentlemen, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin and culture, is like to the lower animals. Not only listen to this address, 
we commit ourselves to publishing it. Sundry, we'll be able to know our past. If rightly in better future. Once again, I want to thank audience. Bearing in mind that we don't have students around.